Good. Well, welcome everybody. Happy New Year. And welcome to the first uh, Astro Cafe of uh, 1924. Uh, 2024. Right. Uh, 2024. Um, so uh, this is the Astro Cafe for January the 4th, 2024. Um, firstly, is there anybody who have spoken with who wants to put anything forward today? I have David uh, Payne. Um, Reg uh, Dunkley's got some some announcements to make. Randy has a a um, uh, presentation. Um, I, I'm going to start with a presentation about Galileo. Um, is, is there anybody else who has anything anything else that uh, you want to bring to attention today? Um, Darren, I, I know I know you've been um, you, you've had your presentation. Um, ho hopefully, we can get that. To today, or if not, uh, we'll, we'll we'll get that in the next week. Um, Chris, can you tell me at this point who's hosting Astro Cafe for next week? Oh, are you okay? Um, so 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 Brock, um, uh, j just to get it on the on the um, uh, agenda, if if we don't get to it today, um, Darren has a presentation about his um, uh, virtual reality. Is is there an Astro Cafe next week, or is it held oh, the same? Very, very good question. Um, Master of Astro Cafe, uh, uh, Chris, do you? I don't know why there wouldn't be. I thought Some during the week issues. there was a presentation we didn't yeah. have. It would be no, the fifteenth. No. Somebody wrote uh, that that the more Astro Cafe is the better. Margie, what are you doing to yourself? <laughs> I'm playing to see what all these things look like. <laughs> to see if anybody's paying attention. That's Margie the unicorn, I think. The answer is yes, there will be. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so, so you okay. Yes. The, the yes. discussion originally was around um, whether they'd be on the same week as yeah. monthly uh, meetings, which means this one wouldn't be happening, actually. Right. Because the monthly meetings this week, not. Anyway. I see. Yeah. Okay. But we're here. So that's good. Okay. So so let me get this started, then I'll just pull up a screen share. Give me a thumbs up. Perfect. Okay, awesome. Good. So <clears throat> this is the uh, 382nd anniversary of Galileo's death. Um, I just I noticed that in passing when Chris asked me to do the the Astro Cafe today. So I did a little bit, bit of reading about Galileo, and it became so interesting that I thought I'd just present I just um, give a little presentation about Galileo. It touches on a whole bunch of things that we deal with, and and certainly a lot about STEM and a lot about science uh, and. Um, so I'll go forward and uh, you can see what you can uh, you can take from this or what what components uh, appeal to you. So just just quickly, Galileo, I mean, we, we, we know of, but we don't know the specifics um, much. He certainly has introduced the scientific method. Um, um it was the the really the first to start um adding experimentation to to observation um uh did some work with study of motion and the pendulum uh did some work with inertia uh, he anticipated uh, newton's first law of motion as you'll see he worked with falling bodies uh developed the law of falling bodies he worked with uh, projectiles and uh, described the the trajectory of projectiles as a parabola which had military implications at the time. And of course, his major contribution was in, in astronomy. He didn't actually discover the telescope, but he was the first to point the telescope at the sky. He had many, many findings um, that shocked the church and, and irritated them. Um, he, purported, he, he put forward strongly the heliocentric model uh, for the solar system, which was the universe at that time. And much of his work was uh, underpinned by uh, by his use of mathematics. 
He was a real, a real proponent of the use of math, mathematics in experimentation and observation. Okay, try again. You're you're muted, Jeff. You're still muted. You got to go back a slide, Jeff. Yes. <laughs> we can't hear you. You're, you're muted still yourself, muted. Jeff. <laughs> oh, still muted. How's that? Now we hear you. Now you're back. Awesome. Awesome. So go back to the slide that you said he was born such and such. Okay. And then yeah. you've had, yeah. There we go. So. But we don't have your slides now. <laughs> your slides are gone. <laughs> All right. This is great, guys. Um, let's see what we can do here. But we're among friends. You're, it's allowed. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's always the start of a, show, a project of a presentation, right? That screws up. Um, so let's see what I can do here. I think what we want to do is go back. Get rid of that screen. There you guys are. Okay, let's try that again. Yeah, do jump in if uh, if I fade out. I'm not sure what happened there. Are we in business again? Yes. You see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, just the slideshow bit itself hasn't started. It's in your notes view. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. What's happened is there's been a, another screen at the top. There we go. Let's start there. Good. You guys got this again? Yeah. Get that one. Okay. What happens is it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, there we are. So you see the next, the next slide? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Galileo, as we read about him, was a fellow who knew his way around the political system at the time. He knew how to work the monetary grant system. Basically, really innovative th thinker who really understood the real politic of his time in the Middle Ages. Born in Pisa, dad was a musician who conducted studies on strings and pitch. He attended a monastery near Florence because he wanted to, to enter the priesthood. His dad discouraged that. His dad wanted him to go into medicine, so he enrolled him in the University of Pisa. He didn't like medicine, so he kind of drifted over to mathematics. Now, mathematics at that time was philosophy, basically the philosophy of Aristotle. So he studied Aristotle and Aristotle's approach to, to the world. He left the university about three years later without a degree. Um, it's unclear from the literature whether he was just bored with university or whether his dad ran out of, ran out of money. But in any case, he became a private tutor in mathematics. That's the point that he started doing some private studies on uh, motion and gravity, falling objects, and uh, had a little following. Uh, he, he published a few papers. Um, among his the followers, among the fellows he had the conversation with was a nobleman, uh, Gibaldi, uh, in Tuscany, who um, also studied mathematics and motion. Um, Gibaldi was interested in his work and referred him to a relative uh, who referred him on further to the, to the Duke of Tuscany. Uh, Duke of Tuscany was uh, in the Medici family, which who were the the um, nobles of the of the time. Just quickly to understand the politics, um, Italy was made up of uh, of city states uh, or st city areas, republics. Uh, they were all independent. Uh, two of the most powerful, firstly, was the one in uh, Tuscany. It was the Duchy of Tuscany, 
It was ruled by the Medici family. Pisa was in that uh, in that um, duchy. Florence or the area around Florence was in that duchy. Um, those are the two most important areas for for um, the study of uh, of Galileo. Uh, some other small areas there as well. The other very big area in the north of Italy was the the uh, Republic of Venice. Uh, Republic of Venice had the second most um, um, <laughs> popular university at the time, the University of Padua. Um, Venice is right on the on the Adriatic. Uh, Padua is just northwest of of Venice. So um, as you see, Galileo spent some time there as well. Anyway, he um, was. Under the, yeah, was that comment? He was he was under the patronage of the um, Duke of Tuscany, so he was appointed to the chair uh, at the University of Pisa. Um, and in Pisa, he started studying uh, the speed fall of the speed of heavy objects as they fell. And his conclusion was this, the speed of fall of a heavy object is not proportional to its weight. Uh, this was the what, what we know as the famous leaning tower of Pisa experiment, which was probably not actually um, something that he did in reality. Um, most of the literature suggests it was just a thought experiment that he had, but certainly followed it. Um, the idea at the time was really Aristotle's, though. And Aristotle's idea was that objects follow the speed proportional to their weight. Um, so this met with a huge amount of derision uh, at the University of Pisa. Uh, and interesting, I, I looked into that a little bit because it seems so counterintuitive that somebody would be talking about things falling uh, proportional to their weight. It, looked as, it looks as if in the literature, Aristotle did his original work with objects falling in liquids. Uh, and in fact, depending on how viscous the liquid, you find that heavier objects do fall faster in, in, uh, in viscous liquids. And that's because there's an additional force that's added, um, the force of drag. Uh, and, and one of uh, Aristotle's other conclusions was that uh, things fall faster as liquid becomes less viscous, which is, of course, true as well. In now, any case, yes. It's really important because my understanding was that the Greeks just did not do experiments that there was nothing natural if you manipulate nature. And so they just would not do any experiments. But this is absolutely saying that he did do experiments, apparently pretty good experiments, but he missed the... the uh, Randy, that is such a brilliant observation. And I didn't want to spend a lot of time on it because there's a lot of really other, a lot of other things, but you're exactly right. And, and I, I looked into that and... He absolutely did not uh, do experiments. What he relied on was observation and thought. And I'm, I'm, I, I think that this was just an observation. I don't think that he did multiple experiments with things falling in in fluids. Um, one of one is a, he, he wrote a book later in life called Physics, which doesn't really refer to physics as we know it. But in in that book, he refers to his finding. That uh, th or his his speculation that things fall um, in, in um, inversely uh, um, with respect to the viscosity of the of the fluid. Um, I suspect he didn't state it quite that uh, clearly, but um, you know this this is a speculation that that he he came to that by by just observing that heavier objects were falling faster in in liquid. So I can't I can't tell you what the liquid was. I couldn't see any any um, um, you know talk about that, but it's certainly what's what's inferred now. Well, but, it, but it's, it's in fact neither is the case. <laughs> it's 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 it, it light things do generally fall slower than heavy things. If you throw a fe if you drop a feather at the same time as a rock. The rock's going to hit the ground way before the feather does, right? Well, it, well, it depends. Um, Apollo well, exactly, 15, it depends, right? Apollo 15 did that experiment on the moon, and of course, it doesn't in the vacuum. So, so I, I think, I mean, my my sense was that Aristotle was looking at something that involved two forces, and and he's absolutely correct that as 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 things become more viscous. 
the heavier objects will fall faster. I, I think you're attributing a little bit too much to that. Okay. So if you if you drop things in a vacuum, then then uh, uh, Galileo was if that's if that's his supposition, then the, he would be right. But if you were to drop two things, the the with different densities on in real conditions, the heavier thing would drop quicker. I think. I think. It, uh, well, I think it would, but in a minuscule, like with, with, with an immeasurable difference, unless there is no, no, no. which is drag or 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 you know hitting the, right. the grab grab a feather and a stone. But but what's the what's the additional force on on the feather? Drag. It's, it's drag, absolutely. Which is a second force other than gravity. Yeah. Yeah, so, so there are two forces at work. My point is neither is neither is provable by experimentation under the conditions they had at the time. So you oh, can't attribute one view versus the other view due to experimentation. Well, I don't and, think and, that... and and neither observation can be said to be right or wrong in general. Okay, F fair I, enough. I, I, I'm just trying to add to the discussion, but <laughs> no, no, it's, it's it's really interesting, Dave. Um, and of course, he wasn't doing any experimentation at all. He was just he was observing. Well, this I'm presenting this yeah. almost as an experiment, but it's not. It was purely observational, and 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 that was that was the first problem that Galileo ran into, where where he was saying, you know, it really is the speed of an object falling is not proportional to its weight. So. That met with a huge amount of, uh, of um, well, derision. Okay, if I go on, Dave, and we'll just yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so anyway, with with expressing this belief, um, he didn't have his contract renewed at Pisa because the Medici family were not happy uh, about this, and uh, they they had, of course, several, several members in the clergy. However, his um, patron. Um, Duke of, Tus Tus Duke of Tuscany had him placed then in Padua, which is the, the other university close to Venice, uh, outside of the, uh, the Duchy of Tuscany. So he entered Padua. Padua, started, he started working in Padua. 1609 was a huge year for him. Um, he firstly developed a couple of, of, whoops, developed a couple of other ideas there. Firstly, determined that the distance fallen by a body is proportional to the square of elapsed time. So the first first um, tinkering with with uh, acceleration uh, due to gravity, or at least revert, involving the square of time uh, in the in the uh, calculation of uh, displacement. Second thing that he did that year, um, cannon warfare was becoming. Um, uh, a major factor, uh, and the um, thoughts of projectiles at that point were that uh, pro uh, projectiles went forward with impetus. When the impetus stopped, the projectile fell to the ground, which was satisfying for people, except when they started using cannons, they actually needed to range the cannonballs. So they needed to know a little bit more clearly how things um were projected um, with with well how projectiles traveled. He determined through some experiments that as Galileo determined that that the projectiles followed parabolas, and he did this by invoking his law of falling bodies, which is a force downward displacement um, occurring with the square of the time, and uniform horizontal velocity. So he involved two forces with the. With the fall and with with his experiment, he he could demonstrate that 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 was in fact a parabola. The other thing that happened in 1609, and this is this is of much importance to astronomy, is that he learned of Hans Lippershe, who was an optician in the Netherlands, who developed what he called a kijker, a looker, where he put two lenses. Um, in a tube and found that he could, depending on, on how the, the lenses were cut, he could make distant objects appear closer or larger. 
Uh, Galileo was very interested in that, uh, constructed his first spyglass using uh, spectacle lenses, it had a, um, a three power um, spyglass. He then became further interested, developed lens grinding to increase the magnification by August of that year. He developed a, um, uh, a telescope or a scope that could magnify by power of eight. Um, Ever the politician, he gifted the uh, telescope to the Venetian Senate, which in the the University of Padua was uh, in the in the area of the uh, area of control of the Senate. So he was then granted a lifetime tenure at uh, Purdue University by the uh, Venetian Senate. He started exploring the sky with his scopes. Uh, September of 1609, he looked at the moon uh, with his uh, scope that he had at that time, which was uh, 20 power. Uh, the, the word telescope really entered the vernacular in 1611. It was named actually by a poet, a telescopist from the Greek tele for far, and scopus to look or see. So far seeing is a telescope. I didn't want to leave you guys without some actual looks at his scopes. Two of them are in, on display in Florence. The first one is from 1609. The, the really interesting thing about uh, the Galilean, the original Galilean um, refractor telescopes is that it used an objective lens that was convex and an eyepiece that was concave. So it, it gave uh, a limited um, field of view, but it did give an upright object. So the, so the first telescope, the 1609 telescope that we know about, uh, had a, the, the objective had a diameter of, of, of 15 millimeters, focal length of 980 millimeters. Um, unfortunately, it's a, it has a replacement eyepiece, so we're not sure exactly about the original eyepiece, but the replacement eyepiece is biconcave with a diameter of 22 millimeters, focal length of minus 47.5 millimeters, giving a uh, magnification of 21 times. Field of view is only 15 uh, uh, minutes. The, the, the one that's, that's, that's more interesting is the longer one uh, in this display. Um, it uh, was, was uh, created in 1610. Um, an objective lens was biconvex at this point, uh, diameter 51 millimeters, focal length of 1330 millimeters. The eyepiece was plano concave with a diameter of 26 millimeters and a focal length of minus 94 millimeters. Um, 14 time magnification, a field of view again of uh, 15, uh, 15 minutes. So very, very small field of view. Um, you know, you have even more admiration for his use of, uh, of the scope, um, but, but, you know, really interesting uh, creations. So what did he see when he looked up? He saw that the moon wasn't flat, but it was rough and uneven. There were craters. He saw that Venus went through phases, suggesting that it actually orbited the sun. Jupiter was seen to have four moons. This is a, a really interesting story. He called the, the moons of Jupiter, the four, the four moons, the Medician stars. Now, at that point in time, in 1610, he was in a rivalry with a German astronomer, also at Padua, by the name of Simon, Simon Marius. Marius and Galileo did not like each other. Um, uh, Marius was a math tutor, and one of his students accused Galileo in 1605, that is five years earlier, of stealing some of his work, stealing, stealing some of his intellectual property. Uh, Marius stood up for him. Uh, Galileo uh, fought the charge. Uh, neither man liked each other very much. Um, Marius claimed that he had actually seen the, the uh, moons of Jupiter um, a, month, a month earlier. Um, the, the, the literature is, is uncertain, but probably Marius did see the moons a month earlier than Galileo did. Marius named the moons of Jupiter after lovers of Jupiter, the, the uh, mythical character Jupiter, and he named them Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. So, you know, we know who won that one, fortunately. So um, the Medician stars are not the names of the, uh, of the moons of, uh, of Jupiter. Uh, Galileo also saw that the night sky contained more stars than we could see with the naked eye. He noted, he noted that Saturn had a very odd appearance. It had lobes or handles. 
he actually argued that the the bulges on on Saturn were uh, were matching moons on either side of the planet, and of course that was later found to be the rings of Saturn. Um, he also uh, started sketching the sun, and noticed sunspots on the sun. So this is this is one of his sketches from uh, 1613. He was blown away by his, his discoveries. He wrote a book called Sidereal uh, Messenger, uh, and he dedicated that book to the Duke of Tuscany. Um, um, following that dedication, he was appointed to be the mathematician and philosopher of the uh, Grand Duke of Tuscany. So just take a step back for a sec to, to, so we can see what the impact of uh, Galileo's findings were. There were two emerging ideas about, about the cosmos, um, the geocentric model and the heliocentric model. And I, I'm sure you know, or you've heard of, of both of these. Um, the geocentric model put the, the earth at the center of the solar system or of the universe. Uh, started with Aristotle, actually it started with, with Plato, but the Aristotle developed Plato's ideas, argued from first principles, beliefs that are obviously true, thought of observation and thought, and did not use experimentation. He felt that the heavens were perfect. He thought the natural state of objects was to be at rest. He felt the earth did not revolve around anything else or rotate on its axis. And he surrounded the earth by 10 concentric spheres that were perfectly transparent and were known as quintessence. And this is how the planets were embedded and this is how they, they went around. Spheres are, the spheres revolved around the earth during all the other celestial bodies. The problem was he could not account for retrograde motion. And it was a big problem with that, uh, with that model that everybody, well, that his um, contemporaries were, were pleased to point out to him. Uh, that was a conundrum, but uh, it still went forward as the, the accepted model. Then Ptolemy came along and Ptolemy worked with Aristotle's model uh, feeling that there, there there were spheres, but added more spheres and, and had the uh, planets rotating on their orbits or on their on their um, deference, as he called them then, uh, in epicycles so that you could have backwards motion. And to account for the different speeds of the planets moving around the Earth, uh, he put the Earth a little bit off center, rotating around a different focus called the eccentric. Um, he created, in the end, uh, 80 concentric spheres um, and uh, continued to work with the, with the um, uh, Aristotle, Aristotelian model. Um, but, but it was starting to, to stretch and, and create some issues uh, because it wasn't really accounting for motion accurately as people studied motions of um, planets more. The other model that um, was emerging was the heliocentric model. This actually started back in the third century with Aristarchus, who thought that um, the heliocentric model accounted for the motion of planets better than the, ge the geocentric model. He, however, was challenged to and couldn't um, explain or couldn't demonstrate any stellar parallax. Basically, they said to him, "Well, if if the Earth revolves around the Sun, then when the Earth is at the different at the different extremes of its orbit, then there should be some shift. We should be able to see some shift of near objects against far objects in the background, which he could not demonstrate. So he abandoned the model. We now know that, of course, there are there are there is parallax, and that's how we we calculate uh, parsecs. But he just didn't have instruments that were." fine enough to, to, to detect that kind of motion. So Copernicus, Copernicus um, was the first really to, to pick up the model then um, in the um, you know, 1500 time frame. He, uh, he came to work with that model um, and for him it was easier to explain the phenomenon planetary motion um, and the problem with his uh, use of the model was that he still insisted that uh, planets traveled in spheres. Um, and because his model um, wasn't predicting, wasn't predictive of orbits, um, it wasn't really pursued very much by anybody. Let me just minimize this. Um, 
so Copernicus still put forward his, his heliocentric model, but wasn't really accepted. Uh, this was a time the church wasn't really happy with the, the uh, heliocentric model, as you'll see. He found an interesting way to put it forward. He, he uh, proposed the, the, the idea, wrote a book about it, and then died in the same year. So the church really couldn't uh, do anything about that. Galileo's observations really started the downward spir spiral that, that he had with the church because all of his findings were at odds with the church's uh, findings. Um, he found that the uh, Jovian moons um, favored the Copernican model because they um, orbited the sun. Let me start that again. The Jovian moons... In, in the view of the church and in, in the view of the of the uh, geocentric model, um, everything orbited the earth. And when um, Galileo demonstrated that moons were orbiting Jupiter, it was uh, quite a problem uh, with the the previous view of, of how things worked. He, he demonstrated that Venus um, had different phases, uh, including a a, um, a full a full Venus, um, and that couldn't be explained with the use of uh, the old um, geocentric um, epicycles. Um, th there's no way in that model that you could see a full a full face of Venus, uh, which which he could which uh, uh, Galileo could demonstrate. The irregular surface of the of the moon. Um, suggested that the heavenly bodies weren't perfect. Uh, they weren't flat and smooth as uh, previously had been thought. Um, Galileo further argued that the sunspots, dark, dark dents in the sun, were actually in the sun and weren't, weren't projected images and weren't small moons, uh, which meant that the sun itself was imperfect. The, the uh, church was, of course, not happy with any of this. Um, in uh, 1616, uh, the, in, in the Inquisition found that uh, Copernicus's theory was heretical. Kepler's book was suspended until it was corrected uh, on, on the orbits. Galileo was cautioned not to, treat, to teach anything that had to do with Copernican theory. And Galileo went, went along with that. That was until 1618. And in 1618, uh, there were three comments in the last half of the year that pointed everybody's eyes to the sky. And this was the first time in human history that things, that the phenomena in the sky could be watched with telescopes. So in um, August, uh, the comet Q1 was seen in Hungary. Um, in November, uh, V1 was seen in Sicily and Rome. And in November, it was actually Kepler that spotted W1, which was seen in Austria. Uh, all very bright comets. In fact, it really, there was a lot of excitement, a lot of writing about it. Uh, the book on three comets was written in 1618 um, about the, the uh, appearance of those comets. Galileo was, was fascinated by that and worked on and um, had discussion with others, uh, finally published a work in 1623, arguing for the use of the scientific method in, in observing the sky. He dedicated his book to the Pope at the time, Urban VIII. Urban VIII, as a cardinal, had been actually a correspondent and admirer of Galileo. So they each knew each other. Um, and Urban VIII was um, able and willing to cut to Galileo some slack. Uh, they met, they talked about the book, and Galileo talked to him about another book that he wanted to write, discussing the uh, heliocentric and the, the geocentric models um, of the universe. Um, Urban went along with it, but cautioned him very strongly to treat anything to do with Copernicus or heliocentrism as theoretical and not actual. So Galileo published his book in 1630, the dialogue concerning the two chief world systems, uh, looking at and comparing the Ptolemaic model and the Copernican model. He submitted to the church censor, which one does in those days, one did in those days. The church censor rejected the book. Um, and for some, something that uh, probably fits better with Monty Python, 
um, Galileo took the books back, rewrote the preface, and the preface said, oh, this is all theoretical, and resubmitted it, and it was accepted and published. So the difficulty for him was he wrote his book as a conversation discussing the evidence for both the geocentric and the heliocentric models, but he wrote it as a learned layman and a simpleton, the simpleton so that nobody lost the, uh, the, the idea. Uh, the simpleton was called uh, uh, Simplicico. Um, and Simplicico um, put forward the church's arguments, uh, relying on God, and the, the learned layman put forward the more rational um, arguments for the, uh, for the heliocentric universe. Pope Urban was not happy with that. He argued that this book was not theoretical, it was not a theoretical discussion. He convened a commission, referred the book for examination by the Inquisition. In 1633, Galileo appeared in front of the Inquisition, and he was pronounced to be vehemently suspected of heresy. He was um, sentenced to prison, um, but I think with the intervention of, Urban, of uh, Pope Urban, uh, he, the, the prison was commuted to a life sentence, uh, placing him under, under house arrest. So the trial, Galileo's trial was really seen as the conflict between two ways of knowing, knowing about nature. First principles versus um, evidence coming from, um, from experimentation and observation. Uh, Galileo, in, in his house of rest, continued working, published further investigations. Um, his book was called Two New Sciences. He talked about the, the law of falling bodies um, and the uh, parabolic path of projectiles. He became blind by about uh, 1638. Um, some speculated that he was blind because he did a lot of observation of the sun. And of course, with those observations, you know, that would have contributed to, um, to, to blindness, basically a, a type of a retinopathy. Um, however, it looks like when he observed the sun, he did it by projection. And some of the medical uh, literature suggests that he had both cataracts and glaucoma. So it was probably from natural causes that he developed his uh, blindness and died then in uh, January 8th, uh, 1642. So contributions to scientific method, the use of observation and experimentation combined, qualitative theory, theorizing became quantitative study. He did demonstrate that the, the period of a pendulum was independent of a displacement of the pendulum. He um, speculated that objects remain at, at, remain at rest or in motion until acted on by another force, which is really a type of statement of Newton's first law of motion. He developed, he looked at falling, falling bodies and, and looked at gravity. Uh, he developed his law of falling bodies, distance an object travels is proportional to the square of time it takes the object to reach the ground. And made the other observation that objects fall at the same speed regardless of weight or shape. Um, he worked with, parabola, with with trajectory and noticed that uh, trajectories followed a parabola involving two forces. He um, always held that mathematics uh, under, underpinned his, his uh, observations and discoveries. Mathematics is the alphabet with which God has written on the universe, is, uh, is, were his words, and made uh, enormous contributions to astronomy. He greatly improved on the Dutch telescope. He used it to, to view the night sky with, with his discoveries. He provided objective evidence supporting the heliocentric solar system. And he helped undo the hold that Aristotle and Ptolemy and the church had on astronomy. 300 years later, um, in October 31st, 1992, the church cleared Galileo of heresy. Wow. So the only real denouement, the other denouement from that is that uh, when NASA wanted to wanted to study Jupiter and the planets, the shuttle that they sent up, the satellite they set up to send up to do that was called uh, Galileo. Galileo was active uh, from 1995 to 2003, and it was crashed uh, into Jupiter uh, to avoid contaminating uh, Europa with um, with any kind of uh, landing there. So that was really the study, the story of uh, of Galileo. Interesting, uh, interesting, interesting background, interesting studies. So, any any comments? Any? Yes, go for it, Dave. 
Oh, just it's it's a real powerful uh, story, and the more the more I've read about Gallery, the 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 more it, it it's easy to fall into the the trap saying, well, they were they were pretty stupid back then, and how could anyone reasonable cling to this geocentric um, view? But it it th there's lots of of um, um, lessons about censorship, about uh, control of of information that was undertaken to suppress what he was trying to get out there. Um, he wrote a he wrote a letter to Kepler, um, where he explained that the the cardinals in the Inquisition refused to even look through his telescope. They just they just would not do it, um, and yet they they convicted him. And uh, I I don't know today uh, I, in today's vernacular he would be called a geocentric denier, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 I use that term just to say that it be it it's a mistake to think that the things that are happening that happened to Galileo Galileo aren't necessarily happening today. So it, it is a really powerful story. Mm -hmm. I agree. You know, it, it's interesting looking looking through some of the stuff, despite what the church held, it didn't make sense to a whole lot of people. And and it was it was like a, a, an underground an underground thinking that, you know, in fact, yeah, that was, that wasn't a really good explanation for things, or, but but the church did did cling. It, it, it is fascinating that that held and, and held back anything moving forward for for you know, fifteen hundred years. I'm not sure if it was that urban, but one of the urban popes was actually a Medici, and the, the Medici were actually the richest family that ever lived in today's money like beyond compare mm -hmm. um and uh the reason behind that was they were allowed to charge interest on loan money and that was forbidden by christians by by the pope so the way the medicis got around that was they made um one of the medici families pope Hey. And then he said, "Well, yeah, in certain circumstances, it's okay to charge interest on money." It's 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 a it's the whole story is actually quite a fascinating history lesson. So I encourage anyone to read about it and and uh... interesting. Uh, any other any other Reg over comment? here? Reg, yeah, go ahead, Reg, go for it. Okay, uh, first of all, a great uh, summary, uh, Jeff. I really enjoyed it. And um, I, I share Dave's unease and, and some of the alarming parallels with maybe the Fox News Network and things like that uh, and the uh, Roman Catholic Church, but uh, we won't go there. Um, uh, my my uh, question is, well, first of all, uh, at one of our general uh, AGM meetings, we had a speaker named Polo and Polo's one of his things was he was very proud that he went to Padua which was uh, Galileo's university so that's where he got his degree um, and his talk was on adaptive optics which had its start really in the military uh, uh, sphere and uh, and the adaptive optics were then applied to astronomy but he raised the point that um, a lot of Galileo studies were very uh, valuable uh, to the Navy and the military, particularly his uh, parabola uh, analysis and the, the refinements that he made to the telescope. So I, I think that was uh, interesting. But the thing that I, I'm curious about, you said that he went into medicine initially and then for some reason dropped out. I 
heard somewhere, and I never verified this, that to make his measurements, one of his clock systems for his, his for measurement was his pulse. And I wondered if he learned to use the pulse as a as a, a primitive clock. Have you did you encounter that in your studies? I didn't I didn't see that. And, and I, I would say that the the stuff I read suggested that he when he went to university, it was under the um uh, it was with his dad's pressure to go into medicine, but he transferred into into mathematics. So I, I don't know at what point he transferred, but certainly, I mean, Pulse, I mean, he would have run across Pulse if he, as soon as he started uh, medical studies. But but no, I didn't, I didn't uh, encounter anything suggesting that that was, you know, that that, 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 that came from a study of medicine. The 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 I don't know how many people have been to Florence, but um, apparently the the museum for Galileo is is in Florence. And it's it's a block from the Uffizi Gallery, uh, and I didn't know that when I was in Florence. Um, it was at the Uffizi, but not you know didn't didn't know that. But it, it sounds like it's quite a it's quite a spectacular, very interesting museum. Um, his construction of scopes, uh, the, the Galilean scope, the real Galilean scope was really very interesting in terms of its, of its structure. Um, I, I hadn't realized that they'd used a concave and then convex, or rather convex subjective and, and, and concave uh, eyepieces. It, 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 I looked at the, the physics of it. it, it didn't make sense until I saw where the focus was, but it keeps the object quite small. And and a very limited um, uh, field of view. I, I think with with one of those <clears throat> scopes, 15, 15 minutes would, would let him see about a quarter of the moon. Our center has a replica. Oh, really? A member built one. It's in my closet. I used it a lot over about a year. Yeah, you could you to do a sketch of the moon. You have to keep moving it around. Yeah. And it is brutal to locate objects because there's no find. I did. I didn't ever put a finder on it, so I wondered to use it like he did, and it it's crazy. And okay. the reason he couldn't see Saturn with rings, if you look at the time period when he observed it, according to the sidereal messenger, Saturn was kind of like it is now, so it was very edge on. So he wouldn't really, because when I was doing my observations, it was quite tilted and you could see the rings because it does. I don't know what the magnification is, but it's about somewhere between 15 and 20 times. Okay, so about what you would have been using? Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I cut the objective to be 27 millimeters and it's a one meter photo, focal length. And it's just two lenses. You can buy those lenses. If you go online and search for the lenses, you can find them and build your own Galileo telescope. On the side of the objective lens, the front end, you can read a thousand on it. It's got it handwritten on the edge of the glass. It says a thousand. <laughs> Interesting. I, I, I had it at Astronomy Day. And I'll bring it this time. And if it's nice at night, we could set it up up at the center of the universe and people could try and look at the moon. That'd be interesting. Yeah. Be interesting to see that. So so <clears throat> to, to all um refractors now is Galilean scopes. I mean in, in generic terms. Is that is that correct? I mean, I, I, there's Newtonian and Galilean uh to, to differentiate refractors and reflectors. I guess so. well, there, there's a number of different formulations for refractors. So um, uh, in the in the pursuit of um, uh, reducing chromatic aberration, which is associated with refractive uh, lenses, uh, there are other formulations. But yeah, Galileo has had the simplest the simplest formulation. I, I guess, Dave, I was just wondering whether as a generic class, if you were referring to all um, refractors, I mean, would you say those are Galilean scopes 
or like is that a generic term or what i i i've always called them like historically i've always just called them refractive uh, or refractors um i don't know i don't know what would be correct i mean galilean uh probably some people use it to refer to specifically the one that he used and other people just refer to it as uh, a synonym for re re refractor okay that's that's how i put it Okay, um, we, we have a really interesting um, situation here. Dave, do you have a projection of it or do you want me to put one up? Oh, I've got some, I got some things I, I pulled up. So, so just by way of introduction, NASA has a, um, puts up a, a picture, an astronomy picture of the day, an APOD. And it's, it's done because um, everybody, anybody around the world can submit um and uh, it's chosen I, i'm not sure who specifically chose chooses uh, perhaps we can hear that but the um image from december 26 2023 um belongs to uh, dave Payne. so he is going to tell us about it and perhaps about the process of applying sure i'm just going to share my screen here um, I'm traveling, so I don't have my normal. Oops. So this is the image that I first posted to uh, our Zenfolio site. And uh, it's an image of a supernova remnant in Gemini. And what a what a supernova supernova remnant is. It's basically what it says. It's it's the remnants of what happens when a star goes supernova. So when a star goes supernova, um, the it's essentially burning out of its uh, hydrogen. Um, that's used as fuel, and it can no longer support its uh, its diameter. So it's it's when a star is burning, it's a, a force going out and a force uh, gravity pushing it in, but the the energy is pushing it out. And when that ener energy starts to um, uh, or the fuel for that energy starts to to be used up, the star collapses. And um, when it collapses, it heats up. Um, some other nuclear forces uh, um, rapidly uh, start to take over other than the fusion of, of hydrogen into helium. And uh, it uh, essentially implodes. And the rebound from that implosion, the, it forces an explosion and it's, it spits out all a lot of its mass um, in in, in uh, material and a lot of photons. It becomes very, very bright. And all that material expands into space. And it forms, in, in this case, it forms something that looks like this, that we come along later and uh, take nice pictures of. Um, and it, they, they take uh, the... The various colors you see here are um, caused by very amount, varying amounts of UV radiation from other stars um, that are hitting that material. And it varies by the composition of that material itself. So you see um, a lot of everything running from reds through greens to some blues on this. So it makes it a very nice image uh, very pleasing image, and I was really happy with it. And when you, um, the other reason I was really happy with it is because I managed to capture a lot of detail. So you can zoom in on any part of this, and you can see little filaments of material that make up this big shape. And somewhere in about this area is the neutron star. You can't really see it, but it's the neutron star that 
is the remains of the original star that created the supernova. So I posted this and I was getting some um, nice feedback from the astrophotography group. And um, I can't remember who said first. Someone said, oh, you should submit this to uh, some photo contests. And I had done that once or twice before and never heard back. So I sort of said, oh, okay, well, uh, th that's fine. And, and, and I wasn't really doing it for for that purpose um uh and then uh gary sedan said oh you should submit it to apod and i said yeah i'd done a couple of other images i submitted them to apod and uh i said okay i'll do it since since i kind of like it and you kind of like it I'll, I'll try it out and so i i put the submission in um, they just want a little bit of a story about you and uh, about what the image is about, and they'll send a, a and and a link to so that they can actually download the image. That was done, and I totally forgot about it until um, a few days where uh, bef before um, before the twenty sixth, I got a note from from the guys who run APOD saying, hey, we created a write-up to go with your image. They didn't use my original write-up, which I don't blame them for, but uh, they said, anything we're saying is is wrong here. To do with that. And I said, no. Go to... And then um, I looked at what they had sent me and it had this date on it. So I suspected this was the date it was going to appear. And indeed on that date, it did, did appear. So I, I was uh, really happy about that and it was fantastic. So um, thanks, to, thanks to Gary for pushing me to, to do it. And, uh, and uh, there it is, it's, uh, I printed it out. Um, because I'm going to put it in a little frame. It's would love to see some NASA logos and stuff <laughs> at the top. It's a pretty simple web page, but it does have um, a link to other images I have, and and it, it was pretty cool. So, Congrats. yes, I basically I tell Dave to quit whining about it and just submit it because I've done this one too, and. It, Dave's Dave's work on this is an order of magnitude better than anything I've ever seen anywhere else. Like it's just astounding, astounding work, and he deserves to get this thing, you know. So good, good going, Dave. Thank you. I've posted the URL in the chat if anybody is interested in in pulling it up for themselves. It's a yeah. lovely. One. I highly rec recommend the APOD. It's, it's, you know, you're sitting down, you're going to do something, you, you're going to check your emails for the day. It's always worth a couple of minutes to go check out what, what the APOD, they, they, they post everything from JF, JWST to amateur astronomer pictures to even non strictly astronomical images when it's, when they're making a, making a point, but you usually learn something from them. That's David, do you know anything about the selection? What, like, what, what was like? You submit it to an individual or to a group? But how do they? How do they decide? Yeah, and if if you go to the the APOD site, um, is is easy to get to. You just search for it, and uh, I think I'm on the. I don't know how to get back here. Oh. Well, that's the day before. So that was December um, 25th image. I'm not exactly sure how I can get to today without just going. Oh, was that? <laughs> I haven't looked here. But there's, oh, here's today's. It's got the phases of the moon. Well, Dave's looking for that. Presentation. But there's a there's links down at the bottom, and one is one is down back. Um, a couple of years ago, APOD published submissions. 
There you go. So it's basically just what I said. It gives you an email address to these two guys who are at uh, University of Michigan Tech University. You can just send your image, a link to your image. You don't have to send the image, um, but a link to it. And uh, they, they, it's basically self-explanatory. So I encourage you if you if you think you got a, a neat image, um, send it along. It won't be on APOD if you don't send it in. That that much can be guaranteed. Um, do you, do you mind if I share a couple other? Oh, please go ahead. I was going to invite you to do that. I was on a little bit of a. Can't see my top level. Hey. There are a couple of questions before you do that. Sure. Sorry, I didn't see that. Gary. Oh, Susan's first. Oh, Susan. Oh, um, I'm I'm quite blown away by this image. And um, have you any idea how big this remnant would be? Um, not off the top of my head, but I might be able to tell you from my write-up. <laughs> that exists. This is our astrophotography saying, well, it's the Victoria Center's image repository on Zen Folio. So if you, if you look up, if you search for RASP Vic Zen Folio, you'll get to this site. Um, it's got uh, all sorts of images from the group. Um, but to answer your question, it is, 5,000 light years away and 70 across. Hmm. And I figure it's about 30,000 years old huh. when the supernova went off. Wow. No, it's yeah, just um, pictures like that just leave me in utter awe about the universe. Because yeah. that's just, that's a little piece of something else. Yeah. Well, what 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 I like about them is like anything heavier than iron that exists on Earth, like nice things like gold, um, uranium to power our plants, our our uh, nuclear power plants, and um, all sorts of the exotic metals and everything, silver, you know, all these things. Um, were can only be created in one of these supernovas. Mm. So, you know, eventually this shape, lots and lots of years from now, will dissipate, and maybe some new stars will be born in there, and uh, some planets will inherit some of those exotic materials um, mm. um, from from a supernova remnant. And yeah. uh, so it's it's really cool story. And I was on a bit of a supernova kick, so I, I took a few couple more images that I'll, I'll show you a couple different ones. Not as nice as this picture, but yeah. Well, I'll just thank mention, you. I'll just mention something here, Dave. As a as an encouragement for folks to get into astrophotography, what APOD's really looking for. And they actually published a list a couple of years ago of what they're actually looking for. It's a story, mainly a story. Um, now, Dave's Dave's uh, work on this one is just simply stunning, of course, but it also has a story that they could tell. So, you know, one of the most striking things I ever saw on APOD was a long distance view of the moon rising with people, uh, people watching it and the moon filled the whole screen. You could actually see the moon rising in real time. It was very compelling. So something that's different and tells a story and not just another, another image of Andromeda is really what they're looking for. And this fits this fits the bill. This is we nobody's ever seen the jellyfish done like this. So that's kind of what they're looking for. Question for Thanks, Ray. Is it, yeah, go, go ahead. Did you have a question as well, or is that? Uh, Dave, before you go to your other images, um, the the star of this uh, or the main uh, character in this image is the 
the spherical shape of the jellyfish. But there's also another interesting thing just to the left of it there. It's almost kind of like a, a cylindrical or conical shape. And I just wondered if you had done any study of what that what might have made that feature or is it part of the same explosion or do you uh, have you done any uh, investigation of that? Yeah, yeah, I did. It. I did look at that because I you know, you'd think when things explode, they're going to be spherical or roughly spherical. Um, and so I did a bit of reading why this sort of had this thing on top. And uh, um, it's actually a really good segue, Reg, because I there was a theory out there, and I don't know if it was ever disproved or, or not, that this is actually two supernovas that have gone off in vicinity um one another so i guess the the issue is the, you know the where the rubber meets meets the road is well there's got to be a black hole or a neutron star left over from from uh from that and i'm not sure we found that yet so that's sort of the acid test as to whether it is two supernovas or not but um, when, when you look at enough of them, you start to get a sense for their character. When you see it very fibrous like that, um, you, you, uh, you, you start to wonder if it, if it is a supernova remnant. It, it, it's an indicator. Like the planetary nebula, they're beautiful too, but they've got a different characteristic shape, which is a normal sized star like the sun, what happens to it when it dies. Um, um, gee, how do I get from the moon? So I was on a bit of a kick, um, but I did find that they're not all, oh, here's another supernova remnant. It's not as, as, as pretty, um, it's a bit yes. dimmer. Um, it's, uh, this is called the bird's nest, or if you flip it upside down, it's called the rice hat because it looks like someone's head inside a, a, you know, a conical hat. Um, but, um, you, you, you start to get this bubbly sort of fibrous structure to them and then you kind of know it's a supernova it, remnant. It, that, that kind of has the appearance of what's called the homunculus uh, in the southern sky. There's uh, two low uh, half spheres that stem from where the supernova has gone kabooey. Yeah. I, Isn't it, that a Carina? Looks very, very much like Eta Carina. No, it's not Eta Carina. I, I know I, I know the one you're thinking of too. Yeah. I don't know if it's, you know, if it's something spinning, if something different happens when it explodes at the poles than happens at the equator. But um, the other thing that's going on is there's stellar winds. There's unseen winds that are blowing um, from all the stars that are around them. And over a long time, they're gonna, they're gonna twist the original shape, even if it did come out perfectly spherical uh, originally. And then the last one, which is actually a very big one. This is actually four times the size of the moon. It occupies four times the amount of sky that the moon saw. So it's a very large, but it's also extremely dim. And this isn't a very good picture of it, but you get that bubbly, it's like a net uh, of, of material um, around it. And then there was one I photographed that I was thinking, is this a supernova remnant? Because it's got that, those filaments um, coming out. This is the, this is, uh, this one's called the, the dragon of, of, the flying dragon of Cygnus. Um, and uh, 
Oh, that that star in the original image that you were talking about has something to do with the light coming off of it. But this turns out not to be a supernova remnant. This was just created by um, stellar winds blowing on a molecular cloud. So you, 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 you're never quite sure of what you're looking at and with a little bit of reading, but it's almost like a, a puzzle and you, you don't necessarily want to read too much because that solves the puzzle for you. So, <laughs> so part of the issue is that. And, and so that, those are the little supernova kick I went on. Um, I did want to show one thing if I've got time or am I eating too much time here? Is it, is it okay? Go ahead. Yep. Um, and, and that was a different kind of image I took. And this is in uh, a huge star field of a dark, of dark nebulosity. Um, and uh, the star field is right in the heart of the Milky Way, a um, uh, constellation called Aquila. Um, and uh, hopefully Dan Posey can show us his magnificent wide view of it. But these are nebula that basically make their existence known by blocking out stars and they're called dark nebula because they're basically dark and they they show up this one is called uh, Barnard's uh, E and Barnard was a guy who cataloged a lot of these dark nebula but you actually see almost a letter E it's backwards here or it could be a number five as if it was created by a typewriter and and you see it by um, the way it blocks out the stars you can see this one's kind of dark. It's got a little bit of a reddish hue. And you can see some stars being blocked out over on this side of the image, too, with some reddish. But it's the absence of stars. It's this opaqueness to starlight, which, which defines them, which is kind of interesting. But, but if I wanted to see more what these nebula looked like, I'd have to go through and sort of take all these stars out of the image and you can you know if you if you do a little zooming in here you get a sense of how many stars are actually in this image yes. and uh you know i could start you know in one of the corners and move my way to the right corner and say hey this is a star and uh using photoshop i could say this star i want to take it out of the image or park it for a little while um, because, but that, that would take a very long time to do. So, so in astrophotography, artificial intelligence has made its presence known. And in this case, um, it's, it's been used to identify the stars and take them out of the image. Now, it, it's not that smart a thing to do. It, it's a little bit tricky. Some stars, you know, if it's a double star, you might not think it's a star, but but uh, AI will gladly go through and do this repetitive extracting stars out of the image and uh, uh, allowing us to see the the nebula behind it. So with some with some tricky photo editing, oh, sorry, I got to navigate back to here again. So for trick, so for some tricking editing, I can take those stars, take them out of the image, pull out what the nebulosity actually looks like, this molecular cloud, and put the stars back in, but make them a lot smaller so they don't cover up so much of so much of the image. And you can get a a, a, a neat effect. Now, normally you would say, oh, if I look at it through um, infrared, I can get a lot of the starlight out of the way, and and uh, or if I look at a UV, but that generally means you've got to put something in space. But with AI, we can actually artificially take the stars out of the sky, 
and see what the nebulosity looks like behind it. Now the nebulosity is more defined by how much light it reflects rather than how many of the stars it covers up. We might do a mistake here. Sorry, I'm on my laptop and there's only so much screen real estate. So there's the normal view. And here's when I get a lot of the stars out of the way. Exact same data, exact same frames we used for both. Wow. So just a hint of the things we can do with image processing. No, I don't think AI should be used to take over as masters for humans, but it's okay for doing astrophotography. <laughs> Go ahead, Gary. One of the things that strikes me with your original image, Dave, is each one of those pinpricks is a star, and each one of those stars has planets around it. There's a lot of planets in that image that you just showed us. <laughs> <laughs> you can't help but wonder, like, what's going on in all those planets? Like, good grief, that's a lot, you know. Yeah. Well, I didn't. I didn't see any uh, spaceships. <laughs> good. Let us know when you get. Great. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Um. I think I think that Randy. Um, had something he wanted to, to talk to us about. Are you yeah. set? I'm going to try something new. I'm going to steal the camera off its Velcro. Is that going to work? Okay. Yes. I have. Okay. And can we um, pin? Can we pin our image for everybody? You can. Uh, yeah. Spotlight. Okay, so um, this was the uh, one of my presents. My kids got this for me. Uh, let's see if I can. There Very we go. Very line on it. So it's um, a puzzle that was actually advertised at Lee Valley, and my uh, kids said, "Oh, that's for Dad." And um, they're very, very clever. I'm just going to do this and then I'll show some other images with a presentation. But it was super fun putting them together. So now let me just share my screen. Maybe I get this back up here. Okay. Good. Um, so share. And the screen, and um, go here and F five. Okay, so yeah, Ravensburger always makes really good puzzles, and uh, this was certainly in there. This was how it showed up in Facebook, and uh. I think it says for age six and up, and it actually is not very difficult. Um, an interesting thing is the uh, pieces on the inside have a number and an arrow. So if you have 64, then you know that 65 is going to be over here. And this is what it looks like on the other side. They're beautifully printed. So how they printed on a spherical surface, I don't know. But this is what it looks like inside. Um, hmm. so, you know, that says 13 and then here is 14, 15, 16. And so you actually, it, it's not a puzzle. It's more a construction. And, uh, what we were, I don't know, everybody around the table took one and everybody got them together. The, um, there are actually only four different models. There's the small planets, which are two inches in diameter, 27 pieces. And then there's the three inch ones that are 54, Earth and Venus. And then Uranus and Neptune were 72. And then 108 pieces for Saturn. So, you know, when you compare to their real 
um, diameters, then um, they're all at very different scales. So the mercury was 5 million to one, and the uh, Jupiter is up at 46 million to one, and the rings of Saturn and Uranus are, you know, really, really at size. So don't go for this to, to for, for as a scale model, but um, if we take a look at them, I'm not sure why they made Mercury so yellow. That's not, you know, Mercury is more um, moon-like. Yes. Uh, but and then this is the famous picture of Venus on the on the right, uh, and that's a false color because this is a radar image. Uh, but um, they were clearly influenced by this image of, of Venus. Uh, Earth, well, I think they did a very good job with, with, with the Earth. It's very good resolution. Um, let me pass the Earth around, and Jupiter is also really, really pretty. Blue? They're not glued. They just hold together really well. What was it like putting the last piece? Okay. <laughs> it's not that hard. It's surprisingly, it, it's it's just about tapping it in. It the, the pieces. It's beautifully. It's a, it's technically wonderfully built. Um, I have to say, I'm unsatisfied with Saturn. Um, it, it's mostly just kind of a a golden ball. I'll pass this one around to you. Um, and the, the rings are just a cardboard print. But like, you know, I'm very keen on the uh, hexagon that you get at the at the pole. And this one is very, it's just a painted circle. So not, not Saturn, I, I feel did not really do it. But it's a hexagon. Well, the pieces are hexagon, but the actual image isn't. No, no, no. It's there. You, you think you, you can see it? If you're looking at the wrong wrong side there, you can see it. Oh, maybe so. Okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> um, a thing that I like is um, there is supposed to be quite a difference in hue between Uranus and Neptune. And I think they caught that very nicely. Um, now, Jupiter and Neptune have very rarefied rings and they aren't in this puzzle. But uh, so first of all, let me recommend it. It's it's really fun. They're very pretty. It's certainly a conversation piece. Um, and uh, it, it's really fun to put together. So that's my little review. Randy, you never mentioned that they come with stands. Oh yeah, they come with little stands. Um, there is a little marble moon. It's kind of underwhelming um, and promptly lost. <laughs> so I don't have my moon anymore. Um, oh well. Randy, how did you put uh, Uranus together since it's featureless? Or is this Uranus? I can never remember which one's featureless. This one is Neptune and this one is Uranus. So. Did you look at the numbers when you were building that one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All of them have the same system inside. Oh, that's you cheating. Oh, and each, each each one comes in its own bag. Yeah, so, you don't have to separate. You don't have to figure out. I, I think that's cheating, too. Oh, yeah, right, it's totally exactly. cheating. It's <laughs> not, this is not a puzzle. It's a construction. Okay. So, so Randy, here's something I... Hello. We've I lost. just read the other day. Uh, there's that. They're all. They're both. He's cutting both out. This, this Gary, Gary, oh, sorry, I'm cutting hear out. you. Say it again. There's very little difference. In, they just. They just published that fact that there's very little difference between the hue of Uranus and Neptune, and the deep blue one was done by Viking and just artificially enhanced to show things, but oh. then it was just accepted as the real color, but it's not. Oh, truth. Sorry. <laughs> Next How time. That? Okay. Illusion busted. <laughs> I thought it was a real difference. Good for you, oh. Gary. 
Viking is Aristotle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll stop that. I just wanted you to see it. It was it was fun. And if you want one, you have to go to Saskatoon now. Hello? What's that mean? <laughs> it's sold out. They're sold out. They're sold out. Oh, good, good for my uh, kids yeah. who have oh, gotten in fell off Saturn. <laughs> they fit on Jupiter. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Randy. Um, Rich, are, is Rich still here? I, I'm, I'm, I'm around. Oh, you're there. Rich, did you want to say anything about the awards? Well, we uh, have, uh, we sent out a message to Sky News uh, requesting uh, people, if they want to nominate uh, someone for the, uh, particularly the Newton Ball Award, they could, if they could please send an email to pastprez at uh, victoria.ras.ca and uh, we will consider your submission. And uh, information about uh, the Newton Ball Award can be found on our website uh, under a thing called About Us and click down there and they have the awards and the uh, criteria required for it. But it's kind of our most prestigious award. But if you have some thoughts or you've seen somebody do something else that you think that they should have some recognition for, please send me a, uh, an email and uh, we will follow up. And we would like to have these by uh, about the middle of January, because we have our uh, AGM is r rapidly approaching. Okay, well, th thank you. That's a, a good segue. Uh, was there anything else about the awards? I noticed there were a couple of different um, awards that you had put in that notice. So there, there is one called the Ernie Fannin Schmidt Award, and Ernie was a very creative optician. Um, uh, who like to make uh, interesting telescopes out of kind of rudimentary pieces of piping and uh, uh, and uh, rectangular boxes and stuff like that. So they years ago he he passed some time ago, but uh, he had an impact in the club and they to recognize him. They created this award to honor him uh, about telescope making. Now a uh, while back. Telescope making was a real big activity in the club, but since uh, the cost of uh, commercial telescopes is uh, quite attractive, that's not as uh, active a, an area anymore. But uh, so the last recipient of the Ernie Fannin Schmidt Award was Dave Payne uh, because he developed a tool. Uh, and this tool is used around the world on the, the software PixInsight and I think Searle and has had a major impact on uh, developing of our uh, astrophoto. So th this, we expanded its um, criteria to uh, accommodate other achievements that are in the same vein. So I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Um, so, 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 uh, to that point, um, when I was coming tonight, um, you know how the, the on, it was at 1070 on the radio, and they were talking about, it was just before the Zabowski sign-off or whatever, and it was about a fellow in, I think it was in Victoria, I can't say, I can't say for sure, but um, he has, uh, he was um, a guy who likes to do things, and so he got with his, his a niece, and, she, and he has made um, tele telescopes out of 3D uh, in, in a, he, he make it with a printer. Oh. And he said, the thing today, like today, he said, he got so excited about it that, that he has 10 now. And if you want to use them, you can go and go to his house and he'll give you one to, 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 to play with. And what? because the whole idea was to get this, this, um, the cost really down. Interesting. And, yes, and I just thought this is just so interesting. And when we're talking about how much it was, right? Yeah. yeah. So I don't know where this guy. Um, he's not Victoria. He's in Ontario. But I okay. saw the I saw the news article. Okay. okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, we live in a fascinating uh, time with all these new advances in technology. So. So that's one. Well, well, I've got, I got the mic. Uh, I just wanted to remind people that on Wednesday at UVic 
in room A104, we're going to have Jennifer West give a talk. Jennifer uh, hails from Winnipeg originally, and she was the president of the uh, Winnipeg uh, Center for uh, some time, an avid uh, astronomer. And she went to uh, Toronto and got her PhD in radio astronomy. So uh, uh, the talk that she's gonna be doing is kind of a surveyor of an overview of radio astronomy. She's the uh, Covington um, uh, the fellow at uh, the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory in Penticton right now. And uh, for her PhD, she did some really interesting work on detecting magnetic fields in uh, uh, galaxies, but she's also interested in the uh, magnetic fields in supernovae, and uh, they may explain some of the unusual stuff that Dave Payne is photographing. Mm -hmm. And so it should be an interesting talk for all. So uh, I hope you can join us. And after the meeting, uh, we all retire to the fourth floor of the Elliott Building for cookies, conversation, and uh, coffee. And uh, uh, and uh, Alex kindly opens up the library and people can check out books as well. So I hope to see you there Wednesday night. And the snow is not coming until Thursday, so don't worry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for that. Reg, just... Um, the uh, nominations for for the awards um, should be submitted prior to the the um, I think the social, which is going to be on February the twenty sixth. Um, the AGM is going to be on February the twelfth. We, um, we will be announcing the awards on February twelfth, so we need the uh, the, the nominations by uh, mid January, so we can we can get the process running. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Rich. Do we have a time for the AGM on the twelfth? Do we know what time that that's going to start the uh, the virtual AGM? I'm going to say seven o'clock. Okay, thank you. We haven't we haven't uh, done the okay. homework yet, which is naughty because we do have to get the announcement out. Okay, so you'll you'll let us know for sure if it's going to be anything. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that reminder that Zoom only. So we, there won't be anybody here in this room. We'll all be at home. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other announcements? Lori, is there anything you want to um, raise? Lori has a bunch, yes. <laughs> and you're muted, Lori? It's okay. So you, you didn't get to any of the things that I gave you before, Chris? I don't think so, no, not really. Okay. Okay, that's fine. I did. I wasn't sure. Um, sorry to kind of come in late to the meeting here. Um, uh, so just a couple of things. I I just did want to um, uh, invite everybody to put um, February the twenty sixth, which is two two Mondays after the twelfth. Two Mondays after the twelfth. Doesn't sound right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, for the social. Uh, which is going to be uh, at the four mile at the four mile restaurant and on Craig Flower Road. And um, and if we get more than 50 people to come or 50 people or more, then we will have the entire restaurant or the entire that part of the restaurant that will be uh, for our for ourselves only. And they will put anybody else in kind of the other smaller room that comes if we have less than 50 people then there may be some people who will come in to the restaurant itself uh, like we did kind of la have last year but if we can get 50 people to to come then that will be great um it is a, a regular dinner we're just going to be taking things off the regular dinner menu and and the um uh and the like the regular bar menu so there's no there's no extra cost which is just like fabulous um, for us to rent the room or do any do anything like that at all. So um, uh, we'll be maybe what we should do is um, set something up so that there is a registration um, uh, registration process um, and uh, so that we know how many how who's coming and we can uh, we can keep track of we can keep track of that. But please bring uh, bring your your spouse or significant other or 
your enemy or whatever whoever you'd like to come to uh come and come at the come for the um, for the party and uh and we're looking forward to just having some um some time there will be you know a few announcements and and the awards will be given out at that time um <clears throat> uh we probably can have a um an audio, an audio um feed but we i don't believe that there is any place to have a video like to put up a presentation or anything like that in there but like we did last there will be a, 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 a there i think there's likely a, an audio feed so we'll uh work on that so people can can have that are there any other questions that um people have dave just could you repeat the date um february the 26th you have a it's a monday it's a monday night you have a time for that Lori? um Probably a bit earlier uh, than Astro Cafe because it's dinner, right? Mm -hmm. Right. I'm I I'm not sure. I I don't have in my head what Ken. It was Ken, um, who who talked to the people. I'm thinking that it's probably six or six thirty. I'm pretty sure. Okay. I I thank you. I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, I'll clear. get back to you on that. Thanks, Lord. Yeah, I've I've, I've um, got a I've got a tentatively marked in for six and I, I don't know what the source of that is that's the only thing okay i'm well i'm thinking ken might have talked already to like he already talked and it could be that it was in an it was in a, an email that came out i just i can't i haven't got it picked up um mm -hmm. so so that's that's that and i mean it would be it would be nice to have a couple of people to um uh besides maybe ken and i to have a have a couple of other people um, just kind of stay in touch with, with us to make sure that everything is all done. We don't want to, you know, suddenly realize that we don't have equipment or that we don't have the awards already all set up or that, you know, something else is kind of at the last minute. So, um, it would be great to have a couple of other people. If there's anybody that would like to just, um, help out with that, um, that would be just great. Yeah, um, I can, I can help out, Laurie. Well, thanks, David. Okay. So, um, so that's, so that's that part. Um, I also think knowing that um, how we how we work <laughs> is that um, Astronomy Day is going to be May the 18th at the museum. We have booked the museum um, back back again um, uh, with them. Uh, but it would be really lovely to have to start to have a a team, a team of people kind of building uh, building that up and um, and having a group of people that would take leads on various jobs um, and to really share the to share the um, the work around um, there would be would be fabulous. So just if you're if you're interested in helping out for that, um, then we'll we would we would uh, like to kind of get started um, sooner than later for sure on on some of that. Okay, I'll so the last there. thing is that on the 27th of January, um, on Saturday night, we're having our monthly uh, friend, Friends of the DAO um, Star Party. Um, we're going to do it, I think, probably something like 6.30 to 10. Uh, so we're not going to stay quite as long um, and just get started earlier um, uh, as, as as we did for the, uh, the winter solstice um, one. Um, and it's like it's games night and what we're doing is having i think uh, gary uh sorry randy did you get the email from amy today email today i'm going to share it okay so we're having teams of the nrc against the rasc against the um fdao and they want a team of three people who are going to be the um the contestants and so um, Randy has been kind of asked whether or not there's there's a good team of three people that um, that could be part of the game show. And it's um, there's uh, there's going to be two or three different games that are going to be on not just Jeopardy. It's going to be two or three different things. So if you think that you're very good at the in the gaming in the gaming world, um, tell Randy and he can he can get you on the list. It'll be um, it'll be uh, in person. Um, on the um, uh, on that day and uh, or on that on that evening and we'll um, and we'll kind of be quite fun to be uh, to be part of so um, that's I think that's that's all that I have yeah I'm looking forward to uh, some people getting in touch with me this will be really fun yeah 
Sorry, Lori. Let's see. What say it was? Um, I, I, I'm. I think it's going to be six thirty to ten. We usually kind of start at about seven thirty and go to eleven, but just because it's so dark and I mean, it could be miserable. And of course, if it's snowing, then things will just be probably canceled anyway. So, well, I mean, that's just kind of almost a given <laughs> of that kind of thing. So, but thank you, Larry. Susan asking. Oh, just, yeah. Susan. Go ahead, oh, I, I actually left a message um, uh, on the website or on the phone that I got from the website wanting to sign up. So uh, for the uh, for yeah. the for this for the star party, the yeah. the tickets come out two weeks before the star party um, starts. Oh, okay. We because it, there's a because they come. Um, uh, in other years, when we've had people signing up for the star parties, they would sign up for 22 star parties and then, of course, oh. not come. So okay. we're just we only do it two weeks ahead of time and we can kind of keep track of everybody that uh, that comes. Oh, okay. But we'll be I, we'll be we'll be able to accommodate like 150 people or so that. Yeah. Night, so that well, I've okay. got a couple of friends who are interested in coming. Right. So. OK, Susan, I, I will I will I'll make sure that you get um, oh. you get some. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Sure. I wasn't sure about how we what the signing up process was. Uh, you well, it comes out. Yeah. Yes. Well, that that's that's the big that's the main the main thing is you can come up as a volunteer um, if you're if, like if you're a member of the RASC, right. and uh, so that that's but your the people that you bring with you will have to uh, will have to be registered. Um, Okay. Well, we can get you. A, we can get you that. If if you um if you're a member of the FDAO, then you get uh, you get newsletters and and things coming out, um, uh, giving you kind of any information you need and Zoom mm -hmm. links and and oh, links okay. to get to the get the tickets. Um, for those for the general public, um, then they come out. They they get the tickets a couple of days later. So I see. Okay. Yeah. Laurie, can you explain how people register for that? The Sorry. Sorted, can you explain how reg people register for the? Um, it's through something now called Yep Desk. Um, we had a real problem with Eventbrite. Unfortunately, um, just before Christmas, is uh, Eventbrite uh, started. Uh, we used to be if you if the tickets were free, Eventbrite would give you like would not charge you for um, for getting the tickets, like you could register and as long, you know, so that would, but now they, now they are charging for everybody, no matter whether or not you're a, 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 the, whether the event is free or whether you're a charitable organization or anything. And we just couldn't afford to keep going with them. So yep, Dex is a, um, is a, a company that, um, that, uh, people are working here in Victoria and, um, uh, and we're we've we've flipped over to them. So it's the same idea. Not they don't have quite some of the framework that that Eventbrite did, but it still has worked out just fine for us. So Laurie, how do you how do you spell that? Y e p d e s k. What? Yep. Desk. Yeah. And Lori, is the contact still through the through the website? Is that how? Yes, it, yes, it will be on the, it will, when you go onto the website and you go onto the events page, it will say, get tickets here. And you press them, press the button and it'll go to the Yep desk. Um, and, mm -hmm. and if you get the, if you get the newsletter at the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the links and everything are in the newsletter as well. I, I'm just, I'm just trying to get it verbally posted for people that don't get the newsletter. Yes. Just so they're aware how to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, but but if you are an RESC person who wants to come up and help and and volunteer, uh, I put up telescopes or you know be in the gallery or or chat to people or you know whatever. Then you don't you don't. We need to know that you're coming. It's nice to know that you're coming so that we kind of keep a track. But you don't need to register through the website um, in order to to be there. So, and thanks to everybody who does that for us. Wonderful. Thank you. And is that through the FDAO website or is it? Yes, that's the center of the universe, center of the universe.org. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, super. Th okay, thanks. thank you. Any were there any other things you wanted to mention? Any I don't other? think right now. I think I've I think I'm I think I'm done. It's a quarter to nine. <laughs> David, was there anything you wanted to mention um, at this point? Uh, David Lee? Oh, um, I don't think so. I I think everybody <laughs> knows that the beginners group or the beginners SIG is next month. Uh, we uh, decided to sort of delay that. I haven't heard from uh, Jim Cliff about whether there'll be a makers, uh, but David, uh, as always, we probably will have our astrophoto SIG. Okay. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, is there anything anybody else wants to put forward? Any other comments? Um, any other questions? Okay, it's wonderful. Thank you, everybody, then for attending. Um, and we'll we'll close this uh, Astro Cafe then at this point. And there is one again next week. Okay. Bye-bye. Nice.